Four years ago in the Amazon jungle, my life was transformed as I was hallucinating and vomiting into a plastic bucket. It was exactly the experience I'd been hoping for. <laughs> my life had been in dire need of change because for over 10 years I had suffered with alcoholism and had failed at every attempt to quit or cut back. Willpower, medication, therapists, Alcoholics Anonymous, nothing silenced the call of the bottle. Getting desperate, I boarded a plane for Peru and met with a local shaman who treated me with a purgative psychedelic plant medicine. This may seem like a radical approach to addiction recovery, but I had reason to believe it might work. Back in the 1950s and 60s, psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, and mescaline found in the peyote cactus were at the forefront of psychiatry. These were considered revolutionary compounds offering unprecedented insight into the human mind. Over 40,000 people were given psychedelics in clinical settings, resulting in over 1,000 research papers. Doctors and therapists believed that psychedelics would soon be used to treat a host of mental health issues like depression, anxiety, even incorrigible criminal behavior. The most promising use of psychedelics, though, was in the field of addiction treatment. But as the 60s gave way to the 70s, the Cheshire Cat got out of the bag. The war on drugs began, and legally, medically sanctioned psychedelic research on university campuses was over. Of course, plenty of unsanctioned experiments continued. <laughs> Then in 1990, Dr. Rick Strassman from the University of New Mexico School of Medicine was authorized to lead a study that would inject healthy volunteers with dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, a naturally occurring potent psychedelic compound, the same psychedelic compound given to me by a shaman in Peru. The study was funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse and approved by the University Institutional Review Board, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Drug Enforcement Administration, because using the existing research from decades past, Dr. Strasman was able to demonstrate the relative safety of psychedelics like DMT when they are given under the right conditions. So began the slow psychedelic recovery. These days, only a handful of research institutions in the United States are, are administering psychedelics to human subjects. One of them is the University of New Mexico. <laughs> Go Lobos. Dr. Michael Bogenschutz, a psychiatrist specializing in addiction, is heading a study that treats alcoholics with a combination of motivational enhancement therapy and the psilocybin found in magic mushrooms. After completing a promising pilot study, the team is moving into the next phase, which will include 180 alcoholics who are hoping to escape the cycle of addiction. It's my hope that studies like these will help reveal what it is about the controlled psychedelic experience that leads to lasting addiction recovery. I don't have the most logical explanation for what happened in the jungle. The pivotal night came a couple weeks after I'd arrived. It was my fourth ceremony, the third with this shaman, a chain-smoking Brazilian fellow, maybe 40 years old. We were in a primitive wooden temple on the banks of one of the Amazon's countless tributaries. And the room was pitch black, except for the glowing orange tip of his ever-burning cigarettes. But under the spell of his medicine, I could see, floating around the space, the various components of my psyche, like they were parts of some convoluted Freudian jigsaw puzzle, what a psychiatrist would call a disassociative experience. For hours, I watched my subconscious like it were a movie, while the shaman blew tobacco smoke over my head and sang these timeless songs of healing that sounded quite lovely, but kept making me vomit. <laughs> Things started to return to normal deep into the night. A full moon emerged from the clouds, illuminating the temple, and the pieces of the puzzle began to reform, except the piece that was my desire to drink, it no longer fit. It was like that funny-looking bracket you have when you're done putting together a new desk from Ikea.
That's when I knew the monkey was off my back once and for all. And that's as true today as it was over four years ago in the jungle, although my transformation is something far from understood in the Western model of medicine. 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, was using a paste made from willow bark to treat pain, fever, and arthritis. The medicinal use of willow bark continued up until about 100 years ago. You can still buy some at Whole Foods, but few people bother because the German company Bayer isolated the active ingredient in chalky white pills we know as aspirin. They advertise it as a wonder drug, and it is one. While it does present risks and side effects, it's very effective medicine, one of the few that doctors know with certainty works and how it works. Hippocrates didn't know how willow bark works. He only knew that it did. He may have had some outmoded or mystical explanation considered absurd by modern medical standards, just like my shaman would offer for how addiction recovery works. But does that matter to someone in pain or crisis? Relief from suffering comes first. Understanding how the medicine works, for most, is a distant concern. But I'm a scientist. I'm compelled to understand my recovery. It's my belief that psychedelics have a real potential to treat addiction and other mental health issues. However, I know we'll need many more studies and a better understanding of the mechanisms at work before anyone can expect to take a medicinal psychedelic in a safe supporting environment alongside a qualified professional without the need of their passport. That's years away from happening, but it doesn't have to take decades. We are currently witnessing a rapid shift in state marijuana laws because of overwhelming evidence that for certain conditions, it is the safest, most effective medicine. Perhaps we could see... <laughs> Perhaps we could see a similar movement with psychedelics. I see a number of obstacles to the advancement of psychedelic science. There's America's arcane drug laws. Psychedelics are currently listed as Schedule I, which means they have no known medical use and a high potential for abuse, even though the data we have suggests neither of these is true. There's a need for significant funding. The pharmaceutical industry isn't going to invest millions in compounds whose, whose patents expired decades ago. But the biggest obstacle, the one that can serve to hurdle us over all the others, is the stigma attached to psychedelics. The difference between recreational drugs and the medicines that doctors write prescriptions for is not black and white. Both can be used to harm or to heal or to recreate. After four ceremonies in the jungle with a non-toxic, non-addictive, psychoactive substance that's illegal to possess or prescribe in the United States, my relationship with a deadly, addictive, legal drug was over. There are millions of addicts in the United States alone, and the success rate of addiction treatment programs is pretty somber. While the science of addiction recovery has made virtually no progress in our lifetimes. Well, here's a kaleidoscopic ray of hope. Let's have a rational look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a rational look at this. Maybe others will discover what I did. A safe, viable means of lasting addiction recovery.